let's also bring Arne Quinze to the floor, famous artist and also involved in the Retopia project. Arne Quinze. You brought us drinks. Thank you so much. Thank you. We got thirsty. Thank you, Arne. Welcome. Good to see you again. Yeah. How are you? Fine. Doing well. I, you I have know. a nice warm jacket. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit cold, so... Yeah. It's very good to see you. You're involved in the Retopia project that uh, Sarah just presented. That seems like an immense challenge, and we will talk more about that. But first off, you told me about a very exciting new project, an idea that you've been playing with, and I understood something about aliens. Yeah. So I born in Ghent in 71, and uh, then my parents moved quite fast to to the countryside. I lived there till I was nine years old, and then my parents de decided to, um, to move to Brussels. And I thought, yeah, I will see Star Wars, I will see Avatar, but arriving in Brussels, the only thing that I saw were these big gray walls. And later, by traveling and traveling over the 30 years, visiting all the, the cities all over the planet, I saw these walls all over, and I was thinking about what are they, and digging in, maybe you as a historian, I dig in my own history, but I thought was, everything was in a perfect harmony till 300,000 years ago, before the humans were here, the homo sapiens. So there was a kind of impact of meteorites, and these meteorites, what they brought with them, there was the DNA of humans, humans slash aliens. And they brought another thing with them, is a religion, the religion of four walls. When we were born, the first thing that we see as human slash aliens or this five of the four white walls of a hospital. And then we go to school, then we see the four walls in brick. We go to work, we are encountered by the four walls in, in concrete. We die and they put us under the ground between these four walls again. Why did we miss that train of the beauty of nature? And the four walls, we don't have it not even around us because I had last a discussion with a good friend of me and they say, we need these four walls because we are not made to live like in an organic surrounding, like middle in the nature. We need these four walls. So my whole work, my research is what are these four walls that are constantly yeah, surrounding us. So how does it relate to this topic and the psychology uh, of change, these aliens? I, I think it, the, the, the most important thing as, as we need to do as humans is to try to live in harmony. We all have a big footprint. Whatever, if you take a plane, if you go to the shop, if you buy an apple, whatever, we have that footprint. And I think we, it's the most difficult for us as humans is to change. But I think just to try already to live in harmony with nature could change a lot. I remember when, when I, I moved from the city and I, I, I lived near Ghent in a small green village. And even there, the, the houses are surrounded by the green haze, very well cut very well if, if the controlled because we as aliens we all, always want to constantly control everything to dominate everything if you watch a movie about science fiction when the aliens arriving the first thing what they do is to dominate and to control we are exactly the same we want to control and when i see when how the kids how they grow up in nature is that in, in cities they don't know anymore what is nature? They don't know anymore what is wildflowers, butterflies, insects, etc. How can they be? How can they? How say affected by climate change? Something is happening far, far, far away. So I think to reconnect with nature would be would be nice because in in my heart I'm a gardener. I'm always sitting on my knees in my garden. I planted around my house more than 150,000 plants just to study the beauty of nature. I think many solutions for us are laying in nature, but we need to learn how to see again, how to, 
yeah, to learn to watch. Do you try to give that to your children as well, uh, this harmony with the nature? Oh yes, I, I do, because always I say, let's go to see the new Avatar or the new Star Wars movie. They know what is happening. We go in the garden and we spend hours in the garden. But to look at, the, at nature from uh, uh, a frog um, perspective, yeah. it's, we discover a completely new world. And, and I think it's, we need to stop to try to dominate. I think this, this how, when I travel to cities, it's, I really feel how the, the pain from how is it possible that we manage our cities on such a monotone way, always this, the wall surrounding and everything, yeah. Yeah, it's better than the X with the little stones in it. Do you know the... Never mind, it's in Belgium. You wanted to add to that? Uh, if, you, if you allow me, I'd love to be the, the blunt Dutchman here. So I think I disagree with almost everything you said. Um, <laughs> so you, you rem it reminds me a little bit of you know, the, the film The Matrix, where at some point the villain describes humans as, you know, or humanity as a virus that just wants to spread and invade and dominate and control everything. And I fully acknowledge that is part of the story of humanity. That is absolutely true. There is a history of warfare, of colonialism, of, of expropriation, of, of exploitation, you name it. But there's also a different side to us. And I would say that that's actually a more important and more powerful side. It's the side of cooperation. It's the power of working together. It's the power of growth. It's the power of, you know, really wonderful technologies that, for example, you know, you're able to drive in your car to actually see this, all of this beautiful nature. So what I sometimes think is that it's interesting that today some on the left and the right seem to have things in common, that they all look to the past in which supposedly everything was better. But look, as a historian, I really want to say the past was terrible. It was really terrible. So just like two, three hundred years ago, or say five hundred years ago, when we were supposedly living in harmony with nature, Half of kids, half of all kids were dying, you know, before, the, before they could even become an adult. You know, the vast majority of, of, of people died from terrible diseases like smallpox, which we have eradicated with vaccines. I mean, that is fantastic. I was recently reading about how um, people in America responded to the invention of the polio vaccine in the 1950s. You know, polio was such a, is such a terrible disease, almost eradicated. But, you know, it was especially, you know, um, making y y uh, young kids sick. And when it was announced that Jonas Salk, the great scientist, had in actually invented the polio vaccine, people were going out in the streets. They were honking with the, the horns of their cars. You know, there were celebrations everywhere. It was a uh, very emotional moment. And then I thought, we've become so complacent. Just, just think about how we responded to the COVID vaccines. There were basically two responses, like uh, this took too long or I'm not getting that because it will give me autism or something like that. So I don't know. I think that um, we often underestimate that what you call harmony was actually terrible, terrible suffering. Uh, yeah, but it's, when, I, when I say about harmony is that you cannot compare like 200, 300 years ago. Of course, they could die from a small cut in their finger and they, they died. I think in today is that we are living with 8 billion people and, and with climate change, we will, we will go through a storm. We know that it's coming and we will need to adapt. What I want to say is that by traveling and, and traveling through all different kinds of continents and cultures, what I discover is that there is just one race on Earth. Yeah? And when I look at the, the alien movies over at Star Wars, you see all the different uh, types. And if the, this diversity you find is in nature, but not in, in, in humans, there's just yeah. one race. And if I see how they can kill each other and not to live in harmony, not to live in harmony with their surroundings, we could have it even better. And even that we know we live in the best time ever in humankind, yeah, there's, there's never been so less war as today, never been so much poverty, etc., etc. But still, I think about the future, about my kids. And yes, I believe that we can live in a better harmony.
and, and I believe in that beauty. So I would, I would really agree with you that, say, if you look at the past 200 years, we've, for humans, we've made, relatively speaking, of course, a lot of progress. And still, I mean, the, we, sh we should emphasize the inequality today is still immense. I mean, there's still like 600 million people in extreme poverty uh, who really have to worry every single day about what they're going to eat. Um, but for animals, it's a pretty different story, obviously. With the rise of factory farming, it's probably the worst time in, in, in history to be an animal. And, and just the level of, of exploitation here is, I, I mean, Yuval Noah Harari, who was here last year, I think, uh, has, has called this the greatest crime in human history. So I fully acknowledge that as well. I just think there are, there are two things going on at the same time. And so there's this urban um, thinker, uh, Jane Jacobs, maybe you know her, who always talked about the, the power and vitality of cities, where she was really interested. And, and she once said that there's the, sort of the natural state of a city is decay. There always need to be reasons for growth, but there's no such a thing as stability or harmony. You know, it's either up or down. And sometimes I, I feel that way about our story as humans as well, is that it's either up or down. You know, it's gonna be the good kind of sustainable growth of the things that we actually want, or it's gonna be, you know, a pretty big disaster. Yeah, what, what, what I see, it's, it's uh... The, the difference of age of my kids, my oldest one is 30 years and the youngest one is 8 years. The vision of my little daughter of 8 years already is completely different to what my oldest son 30 years learned in, in school. And I'm very curious to see what is the next future, the next generation, how they will think and how they will yeah, build on, on their own future. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's going so fast these days. Yeah, that's, again, if you look at some simple graphs like um, world population or energy capture or growth in GDP, many of these things, we are in a rocket ship that is basically going like this. So all these lines, if you go back you know, thousands of years, was like this, and then suddenly around the year 7050, we're boom. We, we could very well be living in the most important century in all of human history. And for a long time, as a historian, I thought such statements were a little bit silly, right? We call it chronocentrism. People always believe that they are the most important, right? And that the time in which they happen to be born must be the most important. But then if you look at those, some of those graphs, it, it, it must be true, right? That we, we are living in the century in which our story will be decided. Um, and that, that's a, an astonishing thing to realize. And another reason, by the way, to, and then I will we'll stop insulting your no, profession, no, 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 no. Um, like not it. to follow the news, but me. to focus on the bigger picture. Me, I, will, I will go. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> I have a, a little question about uh, Retopia. Uh, as said, you are involved in that project that Sarah Baron just presented. Can you briefly explain what the project is about for you and how it relates to what you earlier said about uh, we are the aliens concept? I grew up with a father, uh, he, uh, he was one of the godfathers of the Blancard. It's a natural reserve, reserve that belongs to the, to the Swin. So I'm growing, I'm, I'm growing, I grew up through that kind of activism. You have your mother, I had my father. Um, and when I, when I meet people like Sarah, how they fight with their so passionate to give what, all what they have to, uh, to try to give back because I think that is what our biggest task, task is, is to learn how to share and how to give back. And um, Brazil is my, my second home. I'm there quite a lot. And when I saw how the, um, the, these forests are disappearing but at such a speed is that when Sarah came to visit me, I, I I had just one second to think, they say, yes, I join you with this, this fight. And so uh, we try to uh, restore the Atlantic rainforest. And when going there, I, I didn't see the rainforest. It was gone. And, and that is quite a big shock. But when I see the, the, the powers of, of these farmers, how they plant massively, all this kind of the, the, the diversity of the forest there, 
They plant so many trees in a day, in a week, in a year. But the power of these people, they say, yes, we can restore it. And that is so beautiful to see. Could I, could I mention one thing here? Because yeah, this is a, you can. It's a misconception that pops up again and again and again. So the destruction of the rainforest, let it be clearly said here, it's not the fault of vegans. You know? <laughs> it's not, I mean, that's what I get in my inbox every day. Like these vegans, they eat so much soy. And that's, no, 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 no. The soy is for the cattle, you know, that you meat eaters consume. It's not and the it's fault <laughs> of the vegans, but from the aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it, the numbers here are, again, I mean, it's 50% it's of all habitable land is for agriculture, and 75% of that is for eating meat. It's, the, the number, it's hard to wrap your head around the level of exploitation and destruction here. So imagine if you have two weights, and on the one, uh, on the one scale, you put all the mammals like, um, uh, that live in the wild, you know, the... The, the giraffes and the lions and, and the zebras and, and you name it, all of them. And then on the other one, you do all the mammals that we raise as cattle, mainly cows and pigs. Then this group of animals will weigh 15 times as much in terms of biomass as all the wild mammals combined. So that is the level of exploitation here. And that's the reason why the rainforest is gone. Um, to me, I'm, I'm not all that much, well, I, I love shaming a little bit, but if there's, <laughs> if there's one thing to stop doing today is really to stop eating meat. It's, it's the main cause of the destruction here. Uh, let's ask, ask uh, the people here, how many of you yeah, still let, let's eat shame meat? Some people. He I won't be that. shaming you. So let's I will. get the lights on. Who does eat meat? Well, uh, Rutger will be shaming all of you. Yeah, Shame on absolutely. them. Absolutely. And here we go. I mean, Festivals like this, it's all about awareness and about feeling good and, oh, let's plant some trees, but here we are. You're all on the wrong side of history. Sorry, but that's but just what e it is. Even, even if we... Uh, but even think about that we here in Europe became all vegetarians. Is that there is Africa and, and, and India and parts in Asia are growing like a middle class. And what they are doing, the first thing is to consume meat. Even then, we can, will not be able to solve that problem. Sure. Okay, so you can still eat meat. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, I mean, it is especially privileged people who know about the problem, who stay, should take the first step. We're not going to say that we won't do anything about our climate emissions because, I don't know, China is growing or something like that. If we, people like us, do not take this responsibility, we that are so privileged, if we can't even do it, then, I don't know. I, fi I find it hard to wrap my, my head around this. I, I think that's simply to stop eating meat from factory farms, I mean, that's like a very moral minimum today. It's the, the bare minimum to do today. I think they all won't be eating meat anymore. Well, I think most After agree, today. but don't do it. That's <laughs> so let's talk some more. Uh, we might be familiar with the term nature deficit disorder. The fact, uh, you already said it, that many people are emotionally disconnected from nature, resulting uh, in more cases of depression and anxiety, more than ever we understand that a green environment uh, might be wholesome for our mental health. Uh, but for you, Brazil is on the other side of the globe. How to get people engaged here? Here? Yeah. Oh, that's sometimes so difficult to, uh, to engage give... people. Do, um, do you give workshops in your garden? <laughs> But we have a lot of visitors, but, but I think it's, we start, I think, to, uh, uh, to rethink uh, the education in our schools. I think we could start to, uh, to give the right message there with, with the small ones. Um, and, and I think when we see with all the problems that we see now in, in uh, the cities, the, the, they are heating so fast up and they are cutting all the trees, so we create really this kind of ovens. We see that the problems are really there, but then still, to be able to engage people is so difficult. You want to add? Um, so in engaging people spe specifically on yeah. the subject of, I didn't fully get it, uh, how much green in cities? 
It was about his project in Brazil and how to connect people here to nature, here huh, yeah, in connect. Belgium or the Netherlands. I don't know. I don't... I'm, I'm. Do you think it's necessary? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm personally super connected to nature. I mean, yeah. I live in a place called Houghton, which is probably the ugliest suburb which, where is it? Uh, it, that's ever been uh, created. Where is it? It's in the Netherlands. It's a little bit... You didn't get the, the place. It's called Houghton. Houghton. Yeah. It's a bicycle paradise. So in that respect, yeah? it's, okay. uh, it's, it's really great. Um, I don't know. I was just thinking about... Or, or maybe refer to this project I was working on, right? Mm -hmm. How could we make our own lives a little bit more difficult? And there's such an emphasis today on, you know, becoming happy with yourself, mindful, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really into that, to be honest. Are you mindful or? No, not at all. I'm not <laughs> mindful at all, and I don't want to be. <laughs> so my favorite, uh, hero in history was a man named Thomas Clarkson in the 18th century. Um, he was an abolitionist, was one of the first people who really yeah, made a career out of fighting slavery. So when he was 25, he converted to the cause, and then for seven years, he traveled 35,000 miles across the United Kingdom to spread the propaganda, you know, the abolitionist propaganda, and he fought against slavery. He was working seven days a week. You know, he was not mindful. <laughs> uh, maybe he was connected with nature. I don't know, and I don't care. And what happened when he was 33 is that he had a complete, total, utter nervous breakdown, what we today would call a burnout. Yeah, I read about that. Um, which is probably not good. Maybe <laughs> he should have relaxed a little bit. Maybe then he could have, you know, been more effective. But it's people like, like Thomas Clarkson that I really admire. It's not the people who are so obsessed with oh, am I becoming clean with myself? You know, how much uh, uh, mushrooms should I take? Microdose every day to... Uh, that's so <laughs> boring, yeah. <laughs> that uh, brings us again to moral ambition, maybe, uh, what you told earlier. What is, according to both of you, actually, uh, the recipe to light a fire amongst young people? How to provoke that igniting moment, if you like, to be morally ambitioned? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what your experience is, but I think there are a couple of ways. So sometimes you need to insult people. It sometimes works. Um, sometimes not, then it backfires. I mean, it's very different, obviously, for, for different groups of people. Um, but just helping, helping them to zoom out and to look at the bigger picture and to let them realize that out of the 120 billion people who ever lived you know, in the history of humanity, we are the 1%. You know, we are the lucky few that live right now in the 21st century and are also among the richest and most privileged even in our time. So we've won the lottery, basically. Just to think about it, we could have been enslaved in ancient Egypt. We could have, you know, lived as a farmer in the Middle Ages. But here we do find ourselves at the most extraordinary moment in human history. And what do we do? That's the question. Yeah, but I think that's too... Easy. I don't think everybody's capable of being morally ambitious. That it's you, you either have it or you don't. No, no, no. no. You I strongly so? disagree. I, so, I, I do. so I recently looked into the psychology of resistance heroes yeah? during the Second World War. During during the war, there were a few people who had the courage to hide Jews in their houses, which was obviously incredibly dangerous. They risked their lives, and there have been many, many studies that try to find out what are the psychologies of these kind of people. You know, why are they able to do such heroic things and why are most yeah. of us not capable to do it? And what they basically found out is that there was no such thing as the hero personality or the hero psychology. What there was, was an idea, a contagious idea. So almost everyone who did something like that during the Second World War was asked by someone else. And that's the reason why um, all this resistance wasn't evenly distributed over the country or over Europe, but you can really see it in pockets of resistance because people were inspiring each other. So that's the way we should link, uh, think about our own actions. It's, it's never that, you, that because you're an individual, you know, that you're doing so much good and having such a big impact. It's because you're being an example to others and because your behavior is always contagious. That's the way you should think about it. And, and it's, it's, it's really not about who you are as a person. It's about what you could 
actually become, what kind of person you could become if you just finally start doing something. Yeah, I, I remember when I, when I moved from the, the city to the village where I live, it's uh, the first thing that I did, I cut the haze out from my, around my ground. And the neighbors came to me, they say, Arne, it's dangerous because you will have all the thieves in, 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 your, in your house. I say, no, I think if I open my garden, the thieves will be at your, in your house hiding behind the hay. And the next thing is that I, uh, I ran a, a, a tractor and a pledge and I took all the green grass out of the, in front of my house. And then I had really troubles with my neighbors. I had with the lawyers and troubles. Oh, you, can, you don't know, man. And uh, till the moment that I saw that I planted all these flowers, because 150,000 plants, it's, it's quite a lot. And that brought the whole neighborhood together. And that now is an example. And now the, my That's neighbors, yeah. they cut less their grass, they have more flowers. And it brought us really back together. Yeah, yeah. So the contagiousness is important. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to uh, make another statement of uh, look at another statement with you guys. Sustainability has a marketing problem. It is said that the most Googled question on sustainability is, do you know what it is? Uh, what is sustainability? Yes, probably. correct. Yeah. yeah. What makes a sustainable future such a difficult or an attractive concept to grasp? What makes a sustainable future such a difficult or unattractive concept to grasp, in your opinion? You well, take this one? Or um, this, is, this connects a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, my, one of my problems with the degrowth movement. I mean, as a politician, it's very hard to get elected if you say, vote for me, you'll get less, you'll be poorer. You don't get this, uh, you can't fly anymore, no plastic straws, you can't even have kids. That's just not very appealing to most people. Um, so I guess what we gotta try and do is to show that the world could be so much better if we make it a more sustainable world mm -hmm. as well. Because that is also the actual truth. Um, new evidence from, you know, from top economists shows that, um, for example, the, the shift to wind and solar energy is going to save us an enormous amount of money. It's going to save an enormous amount of lives. People often think that the main reason to fight climate change is, you know, these droughts and heat deaths and etc. But if you purely look at the numbers, then the main reason is air pollution. Ten billion pe uh, people die. Uh, sorry, ten million people die every year from air pollution. You know, it's one of the most horrible things going on in the world right now. And that's almost all because of fossil fuels. Um, so the world will be so much better if it will be greener. It will be healthier. Um, it will be more productive. And our energy could even become much cheaper. And I think that's actually going to be the irony if I, again, look at it from a historical perspective. Because there's, if there's one thing we know as historians is if energy gets cheaper, then after that you get a boom in innovation and consumerism and you name it. And I think that's what's going to happen, is that we're going to get much cheaper energy if we do this right, and then we're all going to have flying cars and jetpacks and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> and we all become aliens, or we are already. <laughs> uh, during this conference, there is often referred to the crisis of imagination among uh, both citizens and institutions as a root cause of inaction. What are behavioral tactics can you understand? Uh, because I think the sound is really echoing. Eh? What are behavioral tactics to encourage people to imagine you as an artist and embrace attractive future outcomes? It's when 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 I see when when we come uh, when we come into a city to try to uh, change their neighborhood with a with an installation is that in the beginning we have always manifestations against us. What we are doing, how it's possible that we spend so much money for, for to build an installation, to build art, and in, 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 uh, to bring that organic or, yeah, uh, con con uh, construction into the city. And we have always a lot of debates in these cities because people are afraid of changements. They all live 
they all hold their, their securities. And when we want to dismantle that same installation after three, four, five years, we have the same people, manifestations, signing petitions to, 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 uh, to, to hold that, uh, to, uh, to keep that installation. So for me to see how difficult it is to have the people to change things in their minds, it's so, so, so difficult, very difficult. Do you agree? Yeah, there's this quote from the anthropologist Margaret Mead that I always loved so much. And the quote goes like this, and maybe I'm paraphrasing. Um, Never underestimate the power of a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And usually, this quote is used by, you know, starry-eyed idealists to say, we can change the world if only we believe in it. But I think that if you really think about it, especially the last sentence, in fact, it's the only thing that I ever has. It's only small groups of thoughtful, committed citizens that really change the world. Then you realize that it's a really brutal statement. Because what she's basically saying is that the vast majority of people don't change the world. They just live their lives. You know, they just do what other people do. You know, they don't really think about what they're doing. And it's also, at the same time, quite empowering. Because once you realize that uh, as a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens with a powerful idea and the willingness to make things a little bit more difficult for yourself, then you can achieve astounding things. And that's something you see again and again and again in history, for the better or for the worse. If we think about the rise of neoliberalism, for example, you know, the ideology that's pretty much wrecked the world in many respects, that was just a small group of economists and philosophers in the 1950s. Um, and again, we could do the same today. If you are really thoughtful and really committed and really want to walk the talk, it brings me to my last question, I guess, because it connects to that. For those in the crowd who are about to leave school and enter the job market, or for those in the crowd who are old, I don't mind, uh, or maybe start a business of their own, what would your, you recommend them? What would you like to say to the crowd? Arna. You can do a dance. That's also a possibility. When, when uh, I see, um, when these collectors came to, my, to, uh, to our studio and they have this all well-maintained garden, There's, their house is very well-structured, the walls or there, the garden is well-cut. And when they want to order one of our installations of sculpture, I always take them first to the garden and they have to sit on their knees with me for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an half hour to look, to learn to look again at their beauty. So if I could ask to the audience, when you go home, just sit on your knees in your garden and, and try to see that beauty and try to really to see in what kind of paradise we live, and to take, it, to take care about her. Well, there's another saying that says um, that a lot of people try and climb this ladder of success, and then they reach the top, and they realize, oh, wait a minute, all this time the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So I was pursuing the ideals, or the, the definition of so success that someone else had given to me, but it's actually quite meaningless and pretty empty. Um, so if you're young today, I would really recommend you to be wild, to be radical, to be weird. Um, my experience is that most people after the age of 30 are lost. Uh, you know, if you have Thanks. your own lawn mower and if you have your, like your, uh, uh, I don't know, your mortgage and kids. I mean, most, most people after the age of 30 don't really substantiate. There are some great exceptions, but most, most don't really change anymore. Uh, it's really in your teens and in your 20s that your fundamental views about the world are formed. So that's an exciting time to be alive, especially right now when the challenges are so great. So I would really recommend people to think about what is this ladder of success that you want to climb? Because there are many, many different definitions of success and what's going to be yours. 
and stop eating meat. Yes, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, start uh, planting trees. Thank you so much, <laughs> Great <gentlemen>. summary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, this conversation. Can I get a round of applause for Arne Quinze? And Rutger Brechman and Sarah Parent for, for feeding our head today. I'd also like to thank you, uh, audience, of course, for your warm presence. I hope you enjoy the other sessions and wish you an inspirational journey at the Love Tomorrow Conference. <laughs>